Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello and welcome to this new program called As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. My name is Andrea Giudice and I'm very excited to be having this new program. It's going to be essentially a talk show format. I'm going to have different topics that I think are interesting, and hopefully you will too. And I'll have different guests to help me explain or enlighten or make it more interesting than just me talking at you for a half an hour. And today I have with me Carrie Hooper. And she is here because she was very curious about what it's like to have a guide dog. And one of the most important things in my world is my guide dog. I am blind and I have had a guide dog for many, many years and I'm currently working with my sixth guide dog. And what I know is true is that while a lot of people know about guide dogs or have seen them or heard about them or maybe they've seen something on TV, a lot of people don't know the actual etiquette. What do I do when I meet someone with a guide dog? What don't I do? And so Carrie offered to come and help me especially because she was curious about a lot of these things. So I thought that we would take that opportunity. So I'm very glad that you're here, Carrie. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And um, one of the things that happens is, and this happened, Carrie, when I met you, was you wanted to know the dog's name. I did. I and did want to know the do dog's name. And why am I not allowed to know the dog's name? The reason for that is that he is working when he is in his harness, he is on the job, and whether he's lying here next to my seat or actively guiding me, the harness is his cue that he's at work. And if people were to talk to him or distract him in any way, waving, gazing into his eyes, whistling, then his mind is not going to be on his work. It's going to be on the person who's interested in him and finding him appealing. And the problem with that is that since my eyes don't work and he is my eyes and if he's distracted, it's sort of like being blind again. It's kind of like if we were driving down the road and I decided to just grab the wheel while you were driving. because I, I would thought, prefer you do not do that. <laughs> That's right. See that? Exactly. <laughs> or if, for example, I took someone's eyeglasses and took them to the side of the room and said, oh, they're so beautiful. They're wonderful. Let me give them some food. Let me talk to them. You would never do that to a sighted person. And so the same thing is true of a guide dog. If the dog is working then they need to be completely ignored. Even though they are cute and fuzzy, they have to be totally ignored, not just not petted, but not talked to either. So if I call out his name, it might cause him to walk in a direction that's not the direction you wanted to go in. Exactly, I can give you an example. So I was in a restaurant and someone asked me his name and I um, told them, because I figured, you know, we're in the restaurant, I'm not ever gonna see this person again, this isn't relevant, the dog is under the table. Well, when we got up to leave the restaurant, this, is, this really happened, from across the room comes this person's voice, big and bold and loud, calling my dog's name as he's trying to guide me out of the restaurant. And that's when I realized, okay, so that person, that was an hour after I told that person this dog's name and they still remembered it. So that's when I really decided that not sharing his name is the best policy because I wouldn't want someone to remember it and call it when he was working and he tries very hard to ignore people he knows he's supposed to ignore people when he's working but he's not a machine to so. have his name called would be distracting right. just like yes. if you were at work and someone's like hey carrie you're like oh no i don't hear that <laughs> <laughs> so that's really that's really important and that's how everyone can help him to do his job is to ignore any working dog that they encounter yeah, i see and it says on his handle not to pet because he's a working dog obviously that's within the same uh, realm as the calling out his name. Yes, absolutely. And I have the harness sign on him because I do find that while some people 
pet him as they're reading the sign. <laughs> Other people, I actually hear them saying it out loud as they walk by, oh, I can't pet that dog, he's working. So I think that the harness sign actually does perform a good, a good task, um, which, is, which is really good and really important. That is good. Another thing that is really, really important, and I know this is relevant to you, Carrie, because you have pet dogs. One of the things, I think probably the most difficult thing that I deal with in working a guide dog is encountering loose or out of control animals. And the problem with that is that they're not always friendly. Um, and even if a friendly dog were to come running up to my dog while we were working, that is a distraction in and of itself. He sure. will try to ignore that dog, but, but more in, in much more of a crisis situation is when a dog comes up and they are aggressive. And this is my sixth guide dog and the only one that has not been attacked by a loose dog. And so my statement, my, my, I, I, I beg everyone to keep their dogs on leashes because when I'm working my dog, and I'll call him Juno so I don't have to call, keep calling him my dog. When I'm working Juno and I hear a dog running toward me, I get so afraid because one of my guide dogs actually had to retire because of the attack. And so I think if that person would just keep their dog on a leash or if their dog is on a leash, keep it under control, then they're not going to impact my safety or the safety of Juno. And that for me is paramount. And so I just, I, I can't speak strongly enough about the importance of keeping one's dogs under control and on a leash. That makes sense. Thank you, I'm glad. Okay. Now tell your friends. <laughs> so the most important thing, if I'm out in public and I see somebody with a service dog, the most important thing is for me not to distract that dog by asking its name or by talking to it, looking at it, petting it, offering it snacks, I assume is not okay. Um, is there something that I can do that would be helpful to you? So what can I offer to do? If I see somebody who's working with a service dog, should I offer to help them find something that they're looking for? Or is the dog going to take care of all of that? I don't want to get in the way or interfere with the dog, but I do like to be helpful to people when I can. What kinds of things can I do to help somebody? That is such a great question. You can always ask the person if they need anything. It may be of assistance. Can I help you find something? Um, I find that people, because they see the guide dog and the, and the person working in such a wonderful tandem partnership, they sometimes think that the dog is doing all of it. For example, they think, dogs, they think that the guide dogs can read the red and green lights, which is not accurate. They don't actually know which is red and green. That's my part of the, the job is to listen for the traffic patterns and to know when to cross. Um, so it's always okay to ask and simply just to say, hi, is there anything I could, do you need any assistance? May I be of assistance? And then the second piece of that is if the person says no, thank you, then okay, thank you. If the person says yes, then to listen to how you can help them because this, the, the problem I run into sometimes is that I do need assistance and the person asks and I say yes, I could use some help. And what they do is they either grab some piece of Juno's equipment like his leash or his harness handle and pull the harness handle up and over his head and start trying to drag us across the street, which is very <laughs> not a good plan. It has happened to me. Um, or they sort of take my arm and, and tow me along like I'm, a, like I'm a barge and they're a tugboat. When in fact, what I would like to do is just to take hold of their arm and, and, and let them guide me. So listening to the answer once you've asked if someone needs assistance is so important. And, but it's always okay to ask. That's true of anyone with a service dog, anyone anywhere. True. Yeah. But yes, I think it's always okay to ask and then just to listen, to listen for the answer. So what sort of things he helps you with other than to know, um, for example, if you're walking and there's a wall there, he's going to stop so you don't hit the wall. What else does he do? You say he doesn't read the lights. How does he help you cross the street? You are, this is great. I knew having you on the show was going to be the right thing to do. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so the way that this works is that we're like a pilot and a navigator. He has been taught to, to lead his blind person from point A to point B, avoiding obstacles, stopping at changes in elevation, and navigating around complete blockages of the path. So what that means is if I'm walking down the sidewalk and in front of me the first thing that we encounter is a garbage can that's been placed in the middle of the sidewalk. Juno might simply shift our, 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 our walking direction just slightly so that we just go around that obstacle. 
then I never have to touch it and he never has to stop. The next thing we might encounter on that block is a pickup truck that's, that's, that's parked across the entire sidewalk. In that case, what Juno's job is to do is to stop, to indicate to me that there's something that's not, that means we can't walk safely forward. It's my job to feel forward with my foot and with my hand to feel, okay, what is that obstacle? Because Juno can't say, there's a truck, we can't walk through it. Once I've discovered that the truck is there and that it's blocking the entire sidewalk, I then give Juno the command to find the way around that truck. So Juno might go out to the curb and walk briefly onto the street and then back up onto the sidewalk. Or if that's not going to be safe because there's a big hole behind the pickup truck, he'll walk up onto the grass and around the front of the pickup truck and around. In any time that Juno veers off our path, his goal is to get me back onto that same path as soon as he can after avoiding the obstacle. Now that we're proceeding down the block, we've got the pickup truck and the garbage can behind us. We're coming to the curb. So Juno's going to stop at the place where the sidewalk and the street meet. If it's not an actual physical curb, then he'll stop at the, at the wheelchair ramp or at the place where the sidewalk and the street meet. And he'll wait for my command. If there is a crossing signal at that intersection, then he will show me where that crossing signal is and I'll press the button and listen if it's audible. Otherwise, I'll listen to the traffic. And when I listen and when I can hear that the parallel traffic is going and that makes it safe, I will give Juno the command to proceed. The really awesome thing that happens next is that he then makes a very quick check of our environment. How safe is it to make this crossing? I may have thought it was safe, but there's a very quiet car coming from my coming and I don't hear it. And it's not just electric cars and hybrids. I was and going hybrids. to ask if that was it's electric It's not cars. just electric cars and hybrids. They are pretty quiet, but a, lo a lot of cars, even, even um, combustion engine cars, are, are um, really quiet and it's really disturbing. So there There's, is a second check. That's good. There is a second check and it may that. not even look like it if you were observing us from afar because it's not like it takes even a whole minute or even maybe even 30 seconds, but it does happen when he determines that it is safe he will step out and cross that street. One of the most amazing things to me about guide dog training is something called intelligent disobedience. When we were growing up, and you know, a dog is good if it does what you say. That's what I always thought. What I've learned is that in the case of a guide dog, I'm, I'm constantly giving him commands, not really knowing what's in front of us. I'm asking him to go right, I'm asking him to go forward, I'm asking him to go left. And I'm doing that based on what I believe I know about the environment I'm walking in. But as a blind person, I really don't know what's there. Maybe there is an obstacle there today that wasn't there yesterday. So each time I issue what is, seems like a command, it's really a question. Is it safe to proceed? And his job is to disobey that command if it's not safe. And it might be something as simple as um, a really big puddle because he doesn't like getting his feet wet. So that's an, a really easy example of how if I chose not to listen to my dog, it would be not a good choice, but nothing bad would happen to me. I'd get really wet feet, but mm -hmm. that would be it. Another story, uh, again, a true story of what happened to me with a guide dog, with one of my guide dogs. I was walking in a new area and I was walking along the sidewalk and the dog came to a stop and I, okay, it's ready to go ask the dog to go forward and the dog didn't move. And I thought, okay, asked again. The dog didn't go, and I thought, is the dog distracted? Is it watching a squirrel? Like, what's, I'm, I'm ready to move. So I said it, and, and I even, I, I will shamel shamefully admit, I even said it a little bit forcefully. And the dog not only didn't go, but it walked in front of my legs. It crossed its body in front of my knees. And what that means. That's a very clear signal. Right, the guide dog like can't speak, but forward. what they're really saying is you really need to listen to me. So what I discovered, I always carry a cane with me. When I took it out, I was not standing at a curb. I was standing on a loading dock. I oh. had about a four-foot drop in front of it. I was just going to walk right off, like, oh, sure. And the dog was like, you stupid human. You like, really, you cannot do that. So intelligent disobedience is just a, an amazing thing to teach a dog to have enough confidence to follow your command 99% of the time, but to always know that they have the option of disobeying that command if that's the safest thing. We could be halfway across a street and a car could come from our far lane and he will stop and back me up wow. and get me out of the path of that car. So it's, it's, just, it's just an amazing partnership because every time I pick up his harness handle, 
I'm, I'm trusting him with my life because, well, as I said, 99% of the time we just walk along the sidewalk and nothing scary happens and there's no crazy holes and, you know, dangerous obstacles. But at any point anywhere along the way of any tr route that I'm traveling, that could happen. And I have absolute confidence that he will make the right decision and keep me safe. That's some incredible training on his part. It is. I do it's own dogs, and I <laughs> do admit that that would not happen. <laughs> that, that level of understanding is just not coming across with my animals. That is amazing. So when you're taking a walk somewhere, when your dog is taking you on a route somewhere, you don't say to him, I want to go to the grocery store or I want to go to the bank. You need to know where you're going. You need to know the path. I do, and you know, when I got my first guide dog, I was uh, just about to be to start my senior year in high school, and I was so excited because I thought, oh, I'll never have to think again. <laughs> this is awesome. I'll be like, you know, Juno, find McDonald's, and off we'll go, and, it'll, and it doesn't matter where we are in the world, this dog will know where McDonald's is, and I was apparently getting my guide dog mixed up with my GPS, but um, <laughs> how this works is exactly what you said. I need to know where I'm going, and that's where I come back to the navigator and the pilot. I need to know where I'm going and what the steps are to get there. So imagine if you were reading the directions to get to some place, and it will say, you know, go to this street and take a left, and then go down three blocks and take a right. I need to know all of those things so that I can I can give him those those directives, and then his job is to follow those directives and get me to that place safely. Um, what happens is that he starts to get familiar with places that we go often. So if we're walking through my neighborhood where I do a lot of different errands and shopping and, and, and business, he may stop at a specific place because we've been there before. And that's just him saying, hey, this is some place you've been. Are you sure you're not forgetting this is where you were going? And all it will really take is me saying, no, thank you, not today. And we'll go on to the next place. Some places, if I go to them a lot or if, or if there's a plaza that has multiple places that I go to, I might assign a word or a name to a specific place so that if we're walking into a small plaza and there are five places that I do business, for him that's very stressful. Oh, which one is she going to today? He's trying to anticipate my needs. So if I can say to him, if I give one of those destinations a specific name, then I can say to him, find that specific place, and then that will give him, okay, I know what I'm doing. I don't, want, I don't have to worry about every one of these. So sometimes I'll work with him on, on that, and he learns things really quickly, and it's really fun for him. It's, it's a lot like a game. So he loves to learn new things. I, so I'm t constantly teaching him new words to assign to, to different locations so that he can sort of make that into part of his fun of doing his job when we get to, to a destination. That is so neat. What kind of words does he know? Does he know bank? He knows bank. In fact, when there's a parking lot, there's a, there's a location that I go to where from the, the point where we enter the parking lot, we could either go to a bank or to a store. Mm -hmm. and, and all I have to say to him is bank or store, and he will either go straight or go to the right. That is so neat. He totally knows that. So you kind of only had to teach it to him. I mean, once he knew the route to the bank, you didn't have to keep saying go exactly. to the left or right. go 400 exactly. feet or whatever right. it is. Precisely. What about once you get inside of the bank? Is he still helpful to you? He is, it's, and, and, and that actually brings up another good point, which is that he's allowed to go everywhere that I go. Similar to how you would be able to wear your glasses or someone who uses um, a mobility aid would be able to bring it. My dog can go with me everywhere that I go. And so when I get into the bank or into a grocery store or into any place, I say to him, find the counter. And he'll take me right to the counter. But what I realize is that I really have to, I had to teach him how to find a line because he goes, Okay, there's right ten, up to there's the, the counter, that's, and people, you know, he's a big dog, and they're like, oh, I guess I'll just let him go. And I'm like, well, then we can't let him get away with that. That's so, not so polite. So you, you get to bring your dog everywhere. You don't automatically get to the front of every exactly, line. No, exactly, exactly. Okay. So Good I've been know. working with him on find the line. Now, finding a counter is a pretty straightforward thing. A counter typically looks the same in a store that has a, in a, in a um, say, a jewelry store where everything is a counter. He might not take me to the counter that has the person at it, or the register because everything in that store is essentially a counter. All the showcases look like counters. But a line is a harder thing to learn because lines are different everywhere. I have a hard time finding them <laughs> sometimes. So it's been, it, that took a little bit longer and it, sometimes it is confusing because I'll say find the line and it's, you know, he's not sure exactly where the end of the line is or people aren't sitting really close together. So, he, so sometimes that doesn't work. But 
he always tries. And usually I'll just say out loud, is this the end of the line? And if someone doesn't speak, some, most of the time people tell me. Every now and then they don't. And I was actually in the store one day and I, and I asked, is this the end of the line? And no one said anything. So I stood there and this one like, you just cut me off. And I'm like, well, you had it, your chance. I, had, I asked. I asked and you didn't speak up. So, <laughs> um, so but it's, it's just, I'm just always amazed at the things that I can teach him and the fact that he just loves to learn them because it's all fun. It's not a it's not a drudge for him like oh I have to learn this thing today. It's like I oh have boy to go to work today. Right, exactly. <laughs> how can I how what fun things can I learn today? And I think that keeps him challenged. And it means that because I can't give him a new route every day. It's not like I can go to a new place every day. We have to do this. We have to go to the same stores and run the same errands just like everyone else. So that can get boring. So by introducing something to make that more fun by introducing a new name or going a different way every now and then, that really helps him to stay motivated and challenged but he he absolutely loves his work he, he does not look motivated or challenged <laughs> at the moment he looks quite comfortable he's very good at relaxing and I really love that about him when I um, when I first met him I was very concerned I'll, I'll be honest about that he was so silly and I had never had a guide dog who was so silly when they weren't working and I thought oh dear this one's gonna possibly caused some sort of very spectacular accident with me. As soon as the harness got on, he turned into a totally different dog. So he is the perfect example of someone who leaves their work at work and plays hard and works hard and lives well. And I think that's really helps him to be as relaxed and, and calm as he is because when the harness comes off, he is a completely ridiculous silly ball. And in fact, I've encountered people in the park with him where he was not being a guide dog. I had him there as a, as a regular dog, just on a leash. And I told them that he was a guide dog. And their answer to me was, you mean one of those dogs that didn't make it? <laughs> so and I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and they're like, are you sure you're okay? Yeah, you want some so help getting home? <laughs> he, um, he really knows that when the harness is on, he's very serious. He's got a big job. But when it comes off, he has no concern about worrying about anything but being a dog. And that's that's terrific. That's terrific. Is that typical of the other dogs that you've had or is that, it sounds like that's unusual for this dog. It's, it's, he's more of a dog, I guess I would say, than any of my dogs. He is dog number six and they're all very different. And my first dog, I had to teach her to play and we've gotten to this. So they're all very different. They have different personalities, but um, he is the dog that is got the biggest difference between who he is on duty and who he is off duty. And it's a little bit startling when you first get a dog and they're new and you don't know them and you don't trust them and you haven't built up the relationship and they you know chase their tail and fall down and you think oh dear I'm not sure about this <laughs> and then the harness goes on and they act like they've been working for you know they're a veteran even though they're only 17 months old and you think wow like that is so amazing that is amazing do all guide dogs get trained in the same place I would think that they would be more consistent if they all come from the same training regimen they are not all trained in the same place, sort of similar to a college. There are many programs throughout the country that train guide dogs to do the work that they do. And essentially, again, like college, it, it's it, in the big picture, they're all doing the same thing. They're taking a dog and teaching it to wear a harness and guide a blind person. But the words that they use, the commands that they use, the style that they train in might be slightly different. They also use different breeds. Some schools, most schools use Labradors and Golden Retrievers. Some schools also use German Shepherds. There is one program actually here in Connecticut that only uses German Shepherds. And so there are variations in the breeds that are used, in the style of training. Most programs you go, it's a residential program where you go to the school, live in their dormitory and train in, in their location. There are schools, again, the one here in Connecticut, um, that is domiciliary, which means that they come to you. So you stay in your own home, in your own neighborhood and, and environment and train with a trainer, with a dog that is in that environment. So then there are theories for why one is good for, you know, why each one has, each one has its benefits. Um, it, interestingly, in England, at least last I knew, <clears throat> they do have one guide dog program and they have different satellites throughout the country and everyone does a little bit of both. They go to the school for a little while and then they go home. And that would be fabulous if we had a, we're too, we're too large in our land mass to make that effective for any, any guide dog school to do that as their, as their 
training mod mo model. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, to be a unified school across right, the right, entire exactly. country and, would be difficult. And even even if one each school wanted to do it that way, there was there'd be no way because there's just too many too much too much space. So you would get training for each dog rather than for example if you knew somebody else who had a dog and your dog maybe had a sore foot would you borrow your friend's dog and use that the way I might use my cars in the shop I'm using my friend's car that is an awesome suggestion and no it <laughs> like we don't share glasses with each other I can't swear it's never happened but I will tell you that it's not it no many dogs won't even work for someone else they they are they're very much um, because of the nature of the bond they don't they may not even listen to someone else i mean even if someone else told juno to to sit or stay he might not um i will tell you a funny story from college i was dating a man who was blind and he had a guide dog and we had been eating lunch together in his room and we left for class and i my, my dog just was being weird and i couldn't figure it out <laughs> Had I had dog. his dog. I had harnessed <laughs> his dog and left for class with his dog. Thankfully, in that instance, his dog did work for me, and my dog did work for him. And I got back after class, and I said, "Well, honey, I took your car, but I left you mine, so it's okay." They so, must have been very similar in size. They were and similar shape. in size and shape. They were, yes. <laughs> but um, when you know, they are they are dogs, and, and that's an important thing to remember. So they are just like anyone else's dog. They're pack animals. And so the people who are most important in your world, whether it's the family that lives with you or the family that's most surrounding you, your friends and family, those people are going to become very important. So if I'm walking, if I know that I'm going to be meeting my mother or, you know, one of my friends or someone who Juno knows really well, I can tell when they see, when he sees that person because he's going to react. He's not a machine. And that's the most important thing that I, I really want to get across to people that, 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 to go circle back to where we started, which is that um, the rules of interacting with a guide dog are that when the dog is in harness, they are absolutely 100% on the job and my life is in his hands. And everyone who encounters us can help us to do our job of being a guide dog team by ignoring my dog completely, regardless of whether he flirts with you or whether you think he's cute or whether you miss your dog or your dog, you know, you've been away from your dog for you know five minutes or 10 years and you miss it. I, I feel for all of those things, but my safety has to come first. And that the other thing is that he's not a machine, so he may make a mistake. You may see me have to redirect his attention because he has made a mistake or he may just forget himself or it's a beautiful day and he sees a squirrel and for just a millisecond he goes, oh, I'm a dog. Oh, I'm a guide dog. Squirrels are very distracting. Squirrels are very distracting. <laughs> um, so, and, and that guide dogs do get to play. When they're not working, they are absolutely dogs and they're part of their family's pack and they have multiple toys and much fun. And um, it is not in any way a hardship. When I pick up this harness, he jumps into it because he wants to be there so much. Um, I know that we've been talking and this has been, and I could, could go on forever, but I know that we need to wrap up. So Carrie, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank all of you out there for coming to my, the first episode of As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Look for us next month where we'll be talking about some other truly fascinating topic, at least to me. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks.